Testament and the book of Revelation chapter 6 as we go to further the teaching and the prophetical message of the four horsemen beginning with chapter 6 of the book of Revelation and the second horseman. I would like to remind you that already in the first message about the rider of the white horse and about the commissions of the ha a white horse, we already brought to your attention the fact that this very a specific rider is no other than the papacy. The pontifical system, not only a particular pope at this point in time and the history of the papacy, we do not see yet a particular pope as being the antichrist. But nevertheless, we see the dynasty of the papacy has already given signals throughout history from the establishment and manifestation of the first pope under the Emperor Constantine the Great, immediately we see by his meeting and his call to a meeting of the so-called fathers of the church in 325 when already the emperor himself preside this consul, the first consul of the Roman Catholic institution. This is not a consul of the Christian church, it never was. Even so, the historian has misled millions and millions of people, making them believe that dark consul have something to do with the church of Christ, have something to do with Christ himself, or have something to do with God's own divine revelation, the Bible. The consul that preside the Emperor Constantine the Great, contrary not only to the teachings of the Bible, but contrary to truly history, was well defined even in his own day, in the days of Constantine the Emperor, as a manifestation of the Antichrist that already were inside the church for 300 years. And they begin to pull out, and they begin to accept in 310 the invitation of Constantine for freedom and religious tolerance. These were not Christians that took and accept and accept that pagan invitation of a pagan. Constantine was a pagan. He lived as a pagan and died as a pagan, not never as a Christian. This beginning tell us, according not only to the book of Revelation, chapter 6, about the white horse and the rider of the white horse and the commissions of the rider of the white horse, tell us there was already a preparation, a religious preparation to be followed up by a political power, by a political revelation that there is no doubt is already revealed in the red horse, and the rider of the red horse. We can see not only by the definitions of the colors of the horses, but by the commission of each rider, the commissions that were given by God, the commissions that were not invented of their own heart, but given by God. As you can see, God as a sovereign God has given this commission as part of his judgments upon the earth as part of his judgments and prophecy against those who rebel against the gospel of Jesus Christ, his son, his beloved son, our Lord and Savior, the head, the only head of his church, Christ himself. I would like to remind you also that this dynasty of Antichrist not only was prophesied in the book of Revelation by the very fact of this opening of the seals by Christ himself, revealing the truly identity of the Antichrist, his arch enemy. This is why he was not given to no apostle to open the seals. He was not given to no elders, no prophet, 
not even Mary, as I was expecting myself as a Roman Catholic Jesuit priest, the first time that I read this chapter according to the teachings. The Roman Catholic theologian, especially Jesuit, has brought about saying that the rider of the white horse is Christ. Once that I had that background of this false interpretation, of this interpretation against the revelation of God, already I was denied the rest of the context in the New Testament as well in the Old Testament, beginning with the prophet Daniel, that already prophesied about the coming of the Antichrist, already from the times of Daniel the prophet, in the sense that the Antichrist was not just a mystical person, a religious person, a powerful uh, uh, a spiritual individual, but he was holding political powers too, in his own office, and in his own, in his own office not only, but in his own service, in his own, uh, you might as well say, in his own office, religious and political. It's a combination of both power. One individual, not two individuals, one individual. Nevertheless, always with another power that follow and back up that first power. This is why we have this relationship between the papacy and the political powers of the earth, regardless of the political ideologies of our days and in the years past. We can see that right in order to begin the revelation of the mystery of iniquity, in order that that revelation uh, of that manifestation of that mystery could be known, then the emperor himself has to be removed from Rome to move to Constantinople, the, the uh, capital city of what is today Turkey. And there he moved in order to give, according to the prophecies of Paul himself, writing to the church in Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, that he may be removed in order that that mystery of iniquity may be revealed. What that means, the first pope of the Roman Catholic system. The Lord Jesus Christ himself, in chapter 24 of the Gospel of Matthew, prophesied about four special characteristics of that personality, of that rider, of the white horse. And these four characteristics tell us that it's not only characteristics that come to tell us with meaning, with religious meaning, but imply political meanings too, political power. This is what we see later in Revelation chapter 13, both combination. In Revelation chapter 13, you have the political system with the religious system working one next to the other, up to the point that they become a fusion, a fusion. At the end of chapter 13, you can see that both powers become one. There is no one single individual in all this planet that reflect more of these com two combinations of political and religious power than the Pope of Rome, especially, specifically, at the moment that this prophecy, this prophecy and this message is brought to you in the person of John Paul II. This doesn't mean that he is the Antichrist, but it means that he is in the dynasty of the Antichrist, yes, an antichrist himself. First John chapter 2, verse 18, 19, tell us that already in plural, the antichrist were leaving the church of Christ already in the first century of the history of the Christian church. Antichrist were living in preparation for the manifestation of the single one, of the antichrist. In that divine order, we see the Lord Jesus Christ even in the gospel, prophesying in chapter 24, as we will read immediately, chapter 24 of the gospel of Matthew, saying the following. As he sat upon the mount of the olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, Master, when shall these things be? A question. 
And what shall be the sign, in singular, of the coming and of the end of the world, of thy coming and of the end of the world? We have in these two questions a tremendous revelation. But in the answer to this question, we have even more revelation. We have the answer of our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 4. And he said, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Deceive you about what? Let me remind you that the Lord Jesus Christ was not telling them that they are going to be deceived about hunger. They are not going to be deceived about riots in the streets and the cities and the states and countries. They are not going to be deceived about uh, uh, occult or religion. They are going to be deceived above all these things that nevertheless they are going, people is going to be deceived and are being deceived and has been deceived. They are going to be deceived mainly those who are not in Christ, those who are not as members of the body of Christ, those who are not saved, those who are not redeemed, those who are not being born again yet, they are going to be deceived about who is Christ and who is the Antichrist. What that means that the, the deceit takes place by twisting who is Christ and who is the Antichrist. Those who are not obedient to the gospel, they will appeal to the Antichrist as Christ himself. And those who appeal to the Antichrist as Christ will appeal to Christ as the Antichrist. The fact is that even in the days of Israel, in the days of our Lord Jesus Christ among the Israelites, the Israelites believed that Jesus Christ was not the Messiah, that he was a false Messiah. There was the identity already beginning in the time and ministry of Christ. The same Israelites, they were given promises not only, they were given prophecies about the characteristics of Christ, about the characteristics of his person, about the characteristics of his ministry, about the characteristics of his sacrifice. These Israelites were deceived, believing that he was a false Messiah, that he was a false Christ. Beloved, that will continue on until the last day. Christ will be taken by those in rebellion against the gospel as the Antichrist, and the Antichrist, the last and final Pope of Rome, that will be, will be the Antichrist. That Pope will be received, will be welcomed, will be believed as Christ himself on earth. As a matter of fact, we have enough evidence and proof to our history that in that dynasty, dynasty of popes, already Pope has been declared himself as God on earth, including the present Pope. He is, according to the official title, Vicar of Christ on earth, to as Vicarius Filidei, from which title in Latin come 666. Every syllable in Latin, he gave the value of a Roman number that the total come to be 666. Not only he had the mark, not only he bear the number of a man, but he himself become the fusion of these two powers, political and religious power. This is the very Pope. Not the Pope of tomorrow, nor the Pope of yesterday. The present Pope is already the head not only of his religion, of his system, Catholic, of his church, as he called her. While the Bible called not a church, but a whore. What is a whore before the eyes of God? John Paul II called a church. My church, he said. And he declared himself in his own words, and I quote, I am the pastor of my church. Under this evidence, the characteristics of Jesus Christ in chapter 24 already bring us closer and closer to the red horse. Listen to this as part of the introduction on the message and the prophetical message of the red horse and the prophetical meaning of the rider. Listen to this in chapter 24, verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. 
For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Underline, first many shall come in my name. Second, saying in third place, I am Christ. And fourth characteristic, no men or many shall be deceived. What that means is many first, I am Christ, and listen to this, and his name, second, I am Christ, third, and shall deceive many, fourth. That means that these four characteristics, adding to the characteristic in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation, verse 2, already hold enough evidence to understand that this writer of the white horse is no other than the papacy of Rome. In verse 3 we read, And when he hath opened the second seal, I hear the second beast saying, Come and see. You see, as I said before, previously, and the message of the white horse and the rider of the white horse and his commission, with those characteristics from the prophecies of Christ through the prophecies of the book of Revelation, including the signs that was given to Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and the signs that were given to John the Apostle in 1 John chapter 2 verse 18 on, we see the fulfillment of the prophecies concerning the Antichrist, and the Antichrist in plural relate with the Pope of Rome and the priests of Rome. Listen now, who is backing this Antichrist? What power is behind the religious power that the Pope himself do not have apparently? Listen to this. Verse 4. And there went out another horse that was red. And power, we speak about power. And the rider of our horse spoke among the commission that he was conquer and to conquer. Never before the papacy of Rome had become more relevant than in this century. I mean, never before in the history of the Roman Catholic even, not even in the time of the Emperor Constantine the Great, never before the papacy have now more influence, more power than not even in the Middle Ages. Today the papacy have more influence and more power. He will not move the armies as he did in the Middle Ages yet, but he will be in that position in the future. Right now is moving legislation. I mean legislation. The Pope of Rome is moving legislation. He's promoting legislation. He's dictating legislation to governments in countries all around the world, including the United States of America. Never before in the history of America, never before American has seen the activities of the North American Roman Catholic bishop in their synod, taking decisions, political decisions, to address the Congress of the United States, to address the Senate of the United States, to even persuade the governors of different states, and to even persuade the president of the United States, and even persuade the cabinet of the president through different instruments and members of this body, including to persuade the members of the highest tribunal in this country as the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Never before the army at the highest level has been so much close to be persuaded by Roman Catholicism through the members of that high power. It is the Pentagon. Never before we have seen a majority of Roman Catholics being members of the Pentagon, of the chief of staff of the armies of the United States. Never before in the history of the United States that union of religious and political power has taken more, more reality than today's history, than contemporary history, than today's and United States. Never before we have seen a majority of members of cabinet of president from Reagan down to President Bush. Never before cabinet of this president, never before has a majority of Roman Catholics as this last president they did have and they still have it. 
Never before a majority of Roman Catholic has become to be the majority, the majority, and the Senate and the Congress of the United States. And never before are more Roman Catholic governors in every state and the states around the country, and never before are more Roman Catholic mayors, and never before are more Roman Catholic, including Roman Catholic chief of police. And never before in the history of the United States has become Roman Catholics to be in position within the CIA, within the FBI, within the Internal Revenue Service, within the Immigration Department, within every other department of this government of the United States. From the post office to every other agency, from welfare to every other agency, to social security, never before in the history of the United States, Roman Catholic has won so many positions. It means the Roman Catholicism along this line is growing, along this line is obtaining political power, is being back in their decisions. Let me explain this. The Red Horse, he was given power. He was given to him the set their own to take the peace of the earth and they should kill one and another. And there was given unto him a great sword. This is becoming almost a reality. There is no communism today. Nevertheless, the red horse being that particular color always signal, signal that always has been a political power, whether it was communism, whether it was fascism, whether it was socialism, whether it was anarchism, whether it was any other ideology, including democracy today and monarchy yesterday. Never before we have seen that even democratic governments are appealing to have relationship with the Vatican. I said never before. It's more appealing to democratic government. I'm not talking about kings. I'm not talking about emperors. I'm not talking about dictators, whether they are fascist dictators or communist dictators. This is going into the past because the real power under the red color is coming to be one that is going to be universal. No national, no regional, a universal political power that finally will give the backing to the Pope of Rome in a universal matter, in a universal way, no longer national. But it begins with nation, it begins with government, appealing to the Pope of Rome for negotiations, appealing to the Pope of Rome, appealing to the Vatican for recognition of their government in exchange for their acceptance. They will receive the persuasions of the Pope of Rome the advices of the Pope of Rome, the impositions of the Pope of Rome in legislation and laws in any country is taking place in what, under what is called a concordat. A concordat, it means a political agreement, a secret political agreement between the Vatican and each government in this planet Earth. Concordats between governments and the Vatican always has taken place because the first to take place was the Emperor Constantine the Great. That was the first agreement ever known between a Roman Catholic system already in the hands of the so-called early fathers, already the left the Church of Christ, and the political powers of them, including the army of the Roman Empire, or whatever was left of the Roman Empire. Today we see that these agreements are being, uh, are being brought to a perfection in the sense of different approaches and different means. Let's see, the red horse being red at the same time is impressive to know not only the color but the commission that the rider uh, uh, have. The commission is, among others, is to take peace from the earth and to kill one another. 
and third, he was given unto him a great sword. You can see that the first rider do not have sword, nevertheless, he have a bow. What that means, under a special, a special cover-up, the one that present to you as the man of peace is the man of war. And the man of war, that should be the political power, it is introduced to you as the man of peace. What that means is a paradox. We have governments that are appealing for international peace, never before in history. We have seen so much appeal to peace by government and armies of the earth as today we see it. Not only the politicians, even the armies, the generals of the armies are more appealing for peace than never before. They could be the best military trained, but they have no desire of war because there is a different type of war that is approaching. There is a different type of war that is coming. It's not going to be against one country or another. It's not going to be against one f philosophical or, uh, or ideological system or another. No, it's going to be against the Church of Christ. It's going to be against Christ. It's going to be against the Kingdom of God, against Israel. Listen to this. Let me call your attention to the fact that we read in Psalm, they already was prophesying of these very facts, and men, among many others, in Psalm 2. Psalm number 2. Let me read for you what just we experienced during these last days of many riots and tremendous rage of people. He said, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing. There is no insurrections of governments now against other governments. No, what we see is insurrection of people against their own governments, against their own police, against their own uh, military, against their own uh, uh, safe uh, keepers of the nation. This is what we are seeing and we are watching very close. The people are in the streets of every city, in the streets of every country, of every nation, in complete rage. Imagine vain things. People are taking the power of the police forces in many places today. People are taking the power of the military in many places. Already people have overthrown entire governments in Europe already. And they are ready to do so in the United States of America. But who is behind the meaning, the prophetical meaning of all these insurrections of people, of all this race of the people of every nation? Who is behind? Who is creating this type of anarchy? And why is being done so? Because, again, there is urgent need in preparation for a universal government, as a universal religion. These two writers have all an agreement already. One is backing politically, the other is backing religiously. The political power is backing the religious power, and the religious power is backing the political power that agree with them. There is the papacy and the political power. Speaking of the Red Horse, we understand that the relationship between the rider of the white horse is not only there, but as we will see in the next prophetical message of the black horse, is approaching that other horse in between the red horse, between the white and the black. We have seen throughout history that the Pope have no armies in the Vatican, but at the time that he called for political backing in any circumstances, he have it. Why? Because the celebration of this concordat. Come with me to chapter 17 of the book of Revelation. We will see how in prophecy these concordats are being revealed by God himself. They are in secret, but there is no secret for God. There is no secret for the Lord. There is no secret for a sovereign God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is no secret 
for our Lord Jesus Christ. He has revealed everything. The book of Revelation happened to be the revelation of Jesus Christ. For excellence, that is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is revealing to his church, is revealing to his people, is revealing even to you as a Roman Catholic that may be viewing and listen this message. It's revealing to you as a preventive measure what you are in for within a system that has been rejected of God a Roman Catholic religion, the Roman Catholic religion, that has been the greatest abomination before God, and a system that is not religious, not even so much less a Christian system, is not a Christian, is not even religious. The religion is being used as a cover-up under the political ambitions of that system. The demonstrations and evidence throughout history in every country has been powerful enough to know it. Listen to this right now in Revelation chapter 17 as I bring to your attention this very prophecy. Revelation chapter 17. And there came one of the seven angels which have the seven vials and talk with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sit upon many waters, nations and people with whom the kings of the earth, their governments, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with this great whore upon many waters, sitting upon many people, ruling the people of the earth, making them drunk, oh, causing the greatest oppression that people ever have known from the time of Adam and Eve to our own days. No political system, no religious system, including the old Babylon, including the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, including the Canaanites, the Philistines against Israel. No political power, no religious power has ever caused more oppression to people than the Roman Catholic system has caused during 1600 years of history. Utilizing, manipulating, political power to do so. As a matter of fact, even religiously speaking, every Roman Catholic today, every man, every woman, every child, every boy, every girl, today as Roman Catholic. They are no Roman Catholic. You are no Roman Catholic because any conviction of the Holy Spirit, because any conviction of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You were brought to be Roman Catholic because exorcism and baptism, they are priests applied to you in the time that you were not able to respond to what he was doing on your innocent body, soul, and spirit. That means that Roman Catholicism had never come, nor even to the land of America, from Europe, as came to be in Europe. Never, never from the beginning to the pro historical process, wherever Roman Catholicism was brought by the Jesuits, by the Franciscans, by the Dominicans, to every other land, never Roman Catholicism was taken, accepted, or welcomed because conviction of the Holy Spirit always was because they have used political, economical, educational power, and even military power. The Indians and Aborigines of this land, even from the South of the United States of America, already they have testimony. 500 years of history of Roman Catholicism in this continent of America, from Canada all the way to the Patagon, to Chile, all the way from north to the South Pole, always you can have all the evidence, all the proof the Roman Catholicism was brought to the Indians and Aborigines of these lands by force, never by conviction. The people of these lands always, they were seduced not only, persuaded not only, but they were forced, forced by the power of the arms of the Spaniard soldier, of the Portuguese soldier, of the French soldiers, including in Canada and United States. They were persuaded by military power to be Roman Catholics. The agreement between this power is reflected in Revelation chapter 17. Listen how. 
with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth, as a result of these two riders, of the white horse and the red horse, the two riders, and this judgment of God upon this planet, they has been riding and riding and riding, making this history of every country, of every nation, under which Roman Catholicism has been deplored. Every Roman Catholic country is until this day on the tremendous courses. Not blessings, courses. As a matter of fact, the countries as United States of America that have begun to switch from the gospel to the traditions of the Roman Catholic system from north to south, they begin to feel the pain from the moment that the rider of the white horse arrived to the land of the United States. When this rider of the white horse, the Pope, the first Pope arrived to the land of the United States, then the history of the United States began to change. And the prophetical process of this country and the prophetical destiny of this land begin to be interfered by the interference of the papacy and the prophetical destiny of this country. Yes, they came to interfere with even God's program, as the devil has done even from the early days of the Garden of Eden. The devil showed up to interfere with God's plan in the life of Adam and Eve as early as that. There is no moment in history that God has revealed, that God has promised, that God has prophesied, that the devil has not used an instrument to interfere with that plan, that program, that promise, that prophecy. This is why we see why the inhabitants of the earth has been made drunk. You understand that the political power that is back in that religious power of that white horse is every other political system on earth. It doesn't mean a communism alone. It doesn't mean fascism alone. You can see that all these were experiments on the part of the Jesuits themselves, mainly the Jesuit order. They were experiments. They were political experiments, like in a laboratory. They experiment with life, they experiment with people, they experiment with nations, they experiment with government, they experiment with everything in order to make possible that political power that eventually will back fully, universally, the religion that they persist to be, the Church of Christ on Earth, the Roman Catholic religion. Contrary to this, we see by prophecy not only but even the teachings and doctrines of Christ and his apostles, that even Roman Catholic tradition is a contradiction, a contradiction, a clear contradiction against the teachings and doctrines of our Lord Jesus Christ. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. You can see that from the time that this red horse, the political power, began to back up that religious power, not only from Europe to America, but then later to Asia, then later to Africa, then later to even Australasia, in every other continent, as Roman Catholicism was arriving, they begin to find out something. As they begin to be moved by the political power, as they begin to be protected by political power of emperors, of kings, of governors, of princes, of every other political individual and political position and authority were given the access to Roman Catholic priests and nuns and monks and bishops and cardinals, the way open, the door open to control and oppress the masses and the nations of the earth, to make them drunk with the wine of their fornication. Nevertheless, 
we see that the church has kept through all this, has kept, like Martin Luther once said, has kept on the captivity. Religion wasn't the move because political power wasn't the move. Listen to this. The Roman Catholic system itself, the rider of that white horse, have no power. You can see that have only a bow, and even they have a crown, have no authority. That was given only by political means, always, as a matter of fact, even until this day. Roman Catholic teaching and doctrine and tradition have no power, not even of persuading any person, whether he is an intellectual or an ignorant, have no power of persuasion upon the minds of people, upon the human, have no persuasion. The fact is that through all these years and centuries of Roman Catholicism, making people drunk over this earth, even people, Roman Catholic people, Roman Catholic emperor, Roman Catholic king, Roman Catholic president, from Spain to Mexico, from Mexico to United States, from England to France, from France to even uh, Japan, and from Japan even to India, from every other part of the world. Always we have seen millions, no thousands upon thousands, but millions upon millions of Roman Catholics that have raised up against even the Roman Catholic system, against the Roman Catholic tradition, not because they did believe the gospel, not because they have received Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, not because they were being saved by grace through faith, but because they themselves have become so oppressed, they themselves have become so a slave, they themselves have become under their own leadership, under their own religion, under their own liturgy, under their own sacraments, under their own despotism of the papacy, they have become completely drunks. Once they become a little sober, has happened in many parts of the human history, including in Mexico during the time of Benito Juarez, including in the United States during the time of Evangel Lincoln, including in, in Spain, in Spain, the very country that was the mother of bringing Roman Catholicism to this continent. Right in very Spain, and the first republic and the second republic, when men already they were Roman Catholic, they became a little sober from their drunkenness. They become enlightened on their divine life from the Bible, from the Holy Scripture. And even being politicians and not being Christian, being Roman Catholics, baptized, educated Roman Catholic, they raise up against the Pope of Rome. They raise up against the teachings of Rome. They raise up against the traditions of Rome. They raise up against the death of Rome. Men they knew that something was going wrong with their own religion, not only in their personal experience, not only in their individual needs and desires of Christ, of God, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in their own needs of peace, of love, of justice, of life and eternal salvation. In their own needs, they knew, they sensed that there was something wrong. Men in Spain raise up, and France that raise up, and England that raise up, they all were Roman Catholics. From emperors to kings, and from presidents to governors. Certainly, people, Roman Catholic people, have sensed this for centuries. As a matter of fact, Roman Catholics today are sensing the same thing once they become a little sober. Once they become and they begin to be set free some way, somehow, by reading the scripture, by listening the gospel, and some radio, and some television, and some Roman Catholic Bible, and some monasteries, and some convents, and some parish, and some uh, retreats. Someone begins to be sober. 
and they begin to respond to their disappointment, to their oppression, under the papacy of Rome. Oppression they know there is coming through a channel, not even through religion, but through political maneuvers, to political sophisticated machine that they has been used, even until this moment, to bring about legislation that favor the papacy, that favor the Roman Catholic system. The case in point that we have in a contemporary history is the fight about abortion, a fight that is so negative from those who fight left and those who fight from the right, from those, from every angle, the fight is negative, negative to the gospel, negative to the life of people. They all are confused under the persuasion of Rome. Those who are against them and those who are in favor, both are wrong. No one of these eyes are implemented.